Paul, ladies and gentlemen, my dear friends. I normally don't like to read papers. I'm not a good reader. But today I'm so tired. I came straight from Providence. I, I, I started this morning at 6 in the morning, and I catch a plane. The plane was late. We lost the connection to came to uh, Little Rock. We stayed at Chicago Airport for some hours. So you allowed me not to speak freely, but to read a, a paper. And then I hope it will be possible to have a more open conversation with you. But let me start by saying how grateful I am for the invitation I received, for the words have been said just now. You know, McClatt is an old friend of mine. Every time he introduced me, I'm ashamed. <laughs> I remember last time I was in Council of Foreign Relations in New York. He is so generous in judging what I did that really I don't know how to correspond to such a, a generosity. Anyhow, it is a great pleasure for me to talk with you today about the challenges uh, facing democracy in Latin America at the Clinton School of Public Service. One of the cornerstones of Bill Clinton's legacy to America and to the world is his steadfast commitment to democracy both as a set of rules and procedures, and has the process through which people influence the decisions that affect their lives. Democracy requires, of course, the respect of basic political rights and civil liberties, such as the multi-party political system, free and fair elections, freedom of expression and organization, so on and so forth. But this is what we may call a theme or minimalist concept. Democracy is more than the sum of its institutions and processes. Substantive democracy is embedded on society. It is nurtured and enhanced by a vibrant civil society in a civic culture of participation, responsibility, and debate. That is why democracy is always a work in progress, an unfinished journey. <coughs> It is a process rooted in the history of any given society. It cannot be imposed from the outside. It is never achieved once and for all. The topic of our conversation today is democracy in Latin America. Let me start by saying that in my view, democracy is, much, is very much alive in our continent. Confronted with challenges and threats, yes, but also going through processes of deep change and renewal. It is true that democratic institutions have been put at a severe test in the region of the last, the last five years. In this short period of time, Paraguay, Peru, Argentina, Venezuela, Bolivia, Ecuador, and to a certain extent also Brazil in 2005 and Mexico in 2006, experiencing situations of acute political risk. In several cases, widespread public discontent led to removal from office of elected presidents. The recurrence and intensity of this political crisis are a clear indication that something is seriously amiss. With the exception of Chile, Uruguay, and possibly Colombia, there is throughout the region a widening public disaffection vis-à-vis -vis political institutions. <coughs> All opinion polls corroborate the depth of trust and the pervasive sense of fatigue affecting political parties, <coughs> parliaments, and governments. Latin America, I believe, has entered into a new historical phase fraught with risks and opportunities. My sense is that the best way to safeguard democracy in our part of the world and elsewhere, is always by strengthening and deepening its substance. This is the way for war. Democracy must be made to work or apathy, cynicism, and disaffection will facilitate the resurgence of authoritarianism and old or new disguises. There are several reasons behind the increasing signals of, signals of fragility in Latin America's democracy. Let us uh, briefly review then again. <coughs> democracy was 
the great cause of my generation. Over a 10 year period, starting in the early 80s, 14 countries in Latin America made the transition from military dictatorship to democracy. Each transition process took place within a specific national context. I said it was the great cause of my generation. I'd say that maybe 10, 20 years before, the great cause was growth, economic growth, development. This was the 60s, the 70s, and then the dictatorship came in different parts of, of, the, of the region. That's why, instead of being devoted to, to, to try to improve the well-being of our people and to, to make more economic progress, most of us devote our time in undermining the military regime and trying to implement a democratic pattern. Probably in the future, I hope, democracy will be so well consolidated that it will be much more interest in other questions than in democracy. But in my generation, I must say that democracy is really the, the greatest cause. In the end, taken together, uh, I would say, each trans transition process took place within a specific national context. And yet, to take it together, they reflected a broader pattern, a demand for freedom that swept the whole continent. The restoration of democracy went hand in hand with the promise of a better life for all. However, the political freedom coincided with hard times for most countries in the region. The combination of a rampart inflation with economic stagnation threatened the very fabric of social life. Globalization led, so to speak, to a second drastic process of change, the reform of the state and the opening up of closer economies to foreign trade, privatization and fiscal adjustment. My conviction is that the legacy of political and economic reform was broadly positive in Latin America, since we had to face two different threats, <coughs> to return on the one side, and globalization on the side removed of, of our social fabric and you know, of several institutions, mainly the administration, the, the way the state works, so on and so forth. Growth resumed after the last decade of AIDS. The growth resumed, it's true, after the last so-called lost decade of the AIDS. It's not completely true that the AIDS were a lost decade, but looking from this point of view of economic growth, yes, it is true that we lost opportunities. Inequality persisted and there was an increase in the levels of unemployment and informality. Many of our young people live in despair with no sense of future. <clears throat> we all know that no one lives forever on an unfulfilled promise. The frustration with the incapacity of democracy to improve quickly and significantly people's standards of living is at the root of today's sense of hopelessness. This perception is compounded by the proliferation of corruption scandals and the rising levels of criminal violence, especially in our large cities. Impunity and insecurity combined with the persistence of poverty and inequality explain the profound sense of disconnection between people's aspirations and the capacity of political institutions to respond to the demands of society. Mistrust of politicians, political parties, parliaments and the judicial system is paving the way for the resurgence in several countries of forms of authoritarianism, of populism that seem relegated to the past. To the past. Looking at the growing role played by President Chavez of Venezuela and recent electoral results in Bolivia, Ecuador and Nicaragua, many speak about a turn to the left in Latin American politics. My sense is that reality is far more complex than just a turn to the left. For sure, the door has been opened to demagoguery and to a kind of populism that is heavily tinged with nationalism. Political speech has dangerously shifted from the rational debate of issues and problems 
to the vagueness of growing rhetoric and empty phraseology. Populist leaders speak to people's heart and mobilize powerful symbols and emotions in response to real and imaginary grievances. This direct association of a charismatic leader with the people and the nation undermines the institutions of democracy. It also carries with the inevitable propensity to impose controls by the state over society. Always for the good of the people and the good of the nation, but anyhow, is a, a, a state control over society. This is what is happening in Venezuela, where civil society and mass media are already submitted to all kinds of interferences and uh, restrictions. Populism does not represent a clear risk to democracy that we cannot fail. Sorry, populism does represent a clear risk to democracy that we cannot fail to ignore. It builds on the climate of frustration and disillusionment that makes people think that the way to the future is a return to the past, even though it is a romanticized past that, in fact, has never existed. <coughs> We must certainly be aware of this danger, but without falling, falling into simplifications or exaggerations. First of all, let us remember that Latin America is a huge and complex continent with a very diverse political landscape. There are more differences than commonalities between Hugo Chavez and Michel Bachelet in Chile, Evo Morales in Bolivia and Luis Inácio Lula da Silva in Brazil, Nestor Kirchner in Argentina or Tabaré Vasquez in Uruguay. They are quite different. Second point, in a key point, let us not fall in the trap of equating populism with the left. <coughs> populism is an authoritarian and regressive trend that has little to do with the contemporary progressive vision of the future of our societies. It directly contradicts the building and strengthening of an open and complex society in our countries. Our societies have changed drastically, and for the better, in the last decades. NGOs and social movements were at the forefront of the struggle for democracy in Latin America. This organized dimension of civil society, however, today no longer accounts for the range and diversity of citizen action. As an expression of the capacity of citizens to act by themselves, the hallmark of the contemporary civil society is freedom and autonomy. Civil society is also a contested political space, cross-crossed by the controversies in society. It cannot be appropriated by any single political project. Citizen participation is as is as diverse as the social issues and causes that mobilize people's energy. There is no longer, no longer a grand narrative underpinning uniform strategies of change. This spontaneity and fragmentation is a source of strength, not of weakness. This is a very important point to be stressed. Citizens today have a multiple overlapping identities and interests, ethnic or origin, age group, <coughs> religious creed, sexual orientation, consumption patterns, lifestyles may be a more powerful source of identity than social status. Individuals tend to be more intelligent, rebellious and creative than in the, than in the past. For a very simple reason, they are constantly called upon to make value judgments in life choice where previously there was conformity to a pre-established destiny. Enjoying a sense of greater personal autonomy in their daily lives, in their daily lives, they want a new relationship with power. People make up their minds based on what they believe and what they see. In their knowledge and experience, they have no, no, no relation Sorry. If their knowledge and experiences bears no relation to the methods of politicians, the outcome is disbelief and mistrust. Informed citizens also give rise to public opinion with a growing power to shape and influence public debate. Blogs, emails, cell phones and sites are becoming 
enabling tools for a new type of communication, personal, participatory, and interactive. Empowered citizens no longer accept the role of passive audience. They want to speak and hear. Consider the example of Brazil. Paros is an unjust and yet vibrant society, marked by high levels of social mobility and new forms of citizen participation. <coughs> when I was campaigning in Brazil in 1994 and then again in 1998, I stressed to the Brazilians that, well, you have to, to, to pay attention. We cannot say that Brazil is a poor, a poor country. We cannot say that Brazil is an underdeveloped country. Brazil is an unjust country, which is different. We have the minimal instruments to produce a better society. If we are not doing that, we cannot blame the lack of development. We have to blame ourselves by the fact that we are not paying enough attention to citizens' aspirations and citizens' needs. So I see that now this, this, uh, the fact that citizenship in Brazil is become much more active, much more capable to express by their own, uh, is also a factor that in, in <coughs> introduced the, the dynamic of society and calls for a more efficient and less arrogant actions by the state. Dialogue, not monologue. Partnership, not imposition. Argument, not <coughs> empty rhetoric. Autonomy, not bureaucratic centralism. Interests and identities are fluid, diverse and fragmented. Society is apparently less organized but more connected and more interactive. This combination of individual autonomy and new space for participation debate is, in my view, the best antidote to authoritarian regressions. In complex systems, order cannot be imposed from the top down by a center of command and control. I'm referring to <coughs> It's quite different when we are looking at what is occurring in Bolivia, or in Venezuela, or in Chile, or, or even in Paraguay, or in some Latin American countries, because they don't have a similar civil society. The difference between the current position and the culture in each civil society in different countries explains to a large extent why in some of these countries uh, the fact that, we have, that the government has been not capable to meet people's demands produce a situation of uh, unrest, and at the end, some demagogue could take power. Meanwhile, in other societies, even if we consider that the people's needs are not yet being satisfied, we have the institutions and forms of interaction in our societies that prevent to a move toward a more authoritarian path. I'm not saying that in order to say there is no danger, always there is a danger of authoritarianism, but then how? We have to look at each specificity, each society, at each uh, point in history to see what really one leader, a populist leader, represents and why he was elected and he took power. And in other circumstances, in, in other countries, even when a populist leader is in government, cannot behave as a populist, has to be much more, you know, uh, un under the rules of law and respecting institutions and civil culture. I don't want to refer specifically to any country. <laughs> <laughs> well, neither does social change occur according to uniform and pre-established strategy. Change is an ongoing process that occurs simultaneously at multiple points. By reading actions, innovative experience, exemplary projects generate a critical mass of new ideas and messages that communicators amplify and retransmit throughout the system. <coughs> so far, the new forms of citizen action and communication have not revitalized the political system. If the gap between politi politics and society remains unabated, they may paradoxically contribute to further undermine representative democracy. On the other hand, as a source of a vibrant civic culture, new forms of participation and communication are reframing democracy as a process through which people influence the decisions that affect their lives. Again, if we look at what 
happened in Chile. Chile is under the control of an alliance between some Democrat Christians and socialists. Uh, altogether, I would say uh, the, the Chile government belong to the left, if this, if this word has a, a meaning. Huh? Uh, or like the Uruguay. In Uruguay, President Tavares Vasquez uh, commands an enormous coalition composed by well, leftist parties, including Tupamaros, who have been in rebellion uh, two uh, decades ago. And in Chile and Uruguay, we don't have a similar situation of, of demagoguery and populism. And why? Because in Chile and Uruguay, civil society counts. In Chile and Uruguay, there are also much more uh, energy in the economic realm. So it's, it was possible to pass through the transitional period when we start to, be, uh, to have freedom, democracy, and simultaneously the challenge presented by globalization. Uh, it was possible to accommodate in a, uh, under the rule of law, at least formally uh, under the rule of law. To a large extent, this occurred in Brazil too. Uh, it's a, as you know, as I have been said, it's a huge country, uh, maybe one of the greatest economies in the world, but with, uh, let's, let's say, uh, being generous, 30% of the population is yet living uh, under the, the poverty line. That is to say, 30% of uh, about 200 million, that is more than 50 million. Between 55 million people are, you know, receiving uh, uh, as an average one dollar per day between one dollar and two dollars per day it's nothing and, and, and in spite of that we are not uh, in brazil uh, with, uh, afraid that democracy is, is about to, to to be replaced by other forms of, 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 of political system and the fact is that the, the party is not the ruling party in Brazil, its name is, its name is Working Class Party. And has a, 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 a historical origin far to the left. Again, like in the case of, of the Tupamaros in, in, in Uruguay. Uh, the governmental coalition goes from the former revolutionaries, guerrilla oriented people, to highly conservative people. So it's a tremendous confusion. <coughs> Because you are everything is a little confused. Anyhow, in spite of that, uh, and in spite of what even President Lula said in the, in the past, if including against my, my government, he's following basically similar patterns. And why? Because there's no choice. No more. And why no more choice? choice? Not just because the economic system, integration at the global level imposed some restrictions. But also because population now loves to live in an economy under control, without inflation, uh, knows that they're very important to keep the freedom, knows that the debate is important. Uh, so it's, a, you know, to, to some extent, civil society is stemming the impulse against democracy. If there is an impulse, or there are several impulses, I don't know, but if there are uh, impulse, the civil society is capable to, 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 to tame and to control, and this is, is what really <coughs> comes from really is important. So we are in Latin America at the threshold of a new historical cycle in which the four lines will oppose old models and new ideas, authoritarian regression, and deepening of democracy. The challenge modern democracies are faced with is precisely how to adapt to the changes in society. Democracies have become a space for collective dialogue and deliberation, rather than simply an organized framework of institutions <coughs> where the general will would emerge and be enforced. We must ask ourselves, does it make any sense to speak of a general will in complex and reflexive societies? I don't want to go further than that point because it implies a theoretical discussion with Rousseau and other authors who molded democracy in the 18th century. And I think, well, we have to be a little bit more cautious in taking these ideas and trying to apply these ideas in nowadays societies. Because in, 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 in practice, it's a little bit different. I think they cannot. What we have now 
as the outcome of the democratic process are decisions or rules reflecting the give and take of conflicting interests and values. The more open and transparent the process, the more legitimate it is. We have to adapt to the idea that models of society are fragmented societies, each one wants to have a say in the decision-making process, in the deliberation at least, uh, and the fact that what has to be implemented is more and more process for transparency uh, in such a way that each decision could be legitimated by the fact that people understand what's going on and do participate at one point in time. I used to say when I was in office in Brazil, uh, people said, well, you received 30 million votes, 35 million votes. I said, okay, this was an electoral day, no more. In the, in the following day, you have again to, to open a dialogue with, with, with people. And it's no more possible in, 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 in Brazil to send to, to, to the Congress an important bill uh, without having a previous hearing. Yet, at, uh, when we are discussing the bill, at the executive office, in the executive office, we use the, 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 the internet to ask people about it. Let's, let's, let's change an important part of the of the Brazilian regulatory system, for instance. Uh, how to do that? We have to ask people. Who, uh, and it's true that those who respond normally are interested in the question. It's not the whole society, I know. But then how is this a first step to step a dialogue and to start engaging people in the process of deliberation? Of course, in democracy, in order to have a decision, it requires the representative uh, system, so the vote. <coughs> The vote, those who receive the vote have the right to take the final decision, but the implementation of the, of the decision, the deliberation about the decision requires a dialogue. And this dialogue goes on and on and on, like in America. You have hearings day and night. Everything now, we ask for a hearing. <laughs> well, uh, this is occurring in, in, in several parts in, in, in Latin America. So after we, we, the president send a bill, a bill to the Congress. The Congress, again, we open a, discu a discussion, a debate, and ask people from society uh, to participate. They are not allowed to vote. Only the, those who have the legitimacy to take the decision will take the final decision. But the, meanwhile, the deliberative process requires, you know, a much more space for a participation. And this is occurring in a fragmented way. You cannot <coughs> imagine. Uh, whole society participating at uh, every point in time uh, about every issue. It's not like that. But some important issues require, you know, this, this spirit of uh, to, to open space for other, others' opinion. And it's very difficult, very rare to have a consensus. The consensus is not necessary. What is necessary is the decision be sustained and, and be clearly legitimated by the fact that Several people have discussed it, and the majority has, thought, uh, has one position, which is that one. And that one has been approved. So we are living in a much more complex society, as you know. And this is occurring across the, 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 the at least the Western world. I use, uh, there is an author in, in, in Brazil who used to qualify our situation as uh, uh, the far Western country. No. Uh, we are, we are far uh, from the, 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 the Western, the center of the Western culture, but then how we are Westerners. So, so the, the, in, in that, you know, environment, democracy has become uh, not, not just widespread, but it has become quite different from what has been considered democracy in the past. And this process is not simple to be rooted in, 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 in societies. So when societies are facing poverty, necessity to compete, Necessity to open the economies, plus uh, destroying all, all authoritarian institutions. Well, it's a kind of turmoil. So this, it is understandable <coughs> that here and there, in a so huge region as like, like America, in some cases it's possible, you know, that some demagogues uh, uh, could take the, the, the leadership and uh, track a little bit uh, the, 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 what, what we would like to, to see as a democracy. But then, have, anyhow, I think that all together we cannot look at Latin America as if the disaster is already there because of Chinese. No. You know, or because of the problem. Uh, 
and you cannot compare. If you look Chavez and you look Morales, you see, uh, Evo Morales from, from Bolivia, Evo Morales represents another story. Represent because of democracy, because of the fact that now we are living in democracies, uh, the majority of Bolivian people never had any say at the political system, now has a president. It's the first uh, time ever in, in, in Bolivian history. Well, I know that Morales uh, did an intervention in the Brazilian oil company. I'm not uh, happy with that, mm -hmm. of course. But, you know, but I have to understand why he did. And you have, I also believe that in terms of democracy, you have to understand but would it be possible not to, to do that kind of so, so violent uh, action? I say yes. I see this was also, I mean, the leadership in Latin America, not to have enough strength to influence Morales. Uh, and then we will open space for others to influence him. And probably Bolivia will pay some price for the decision taken. I understand that President Morales had to say, first uh, indigenous president in history, he has to do something for his people. And people will look at him, well, one year away, two years away. And then, no, again, this is too much. So he has to, to try to increase you know, the, the flow of money uh, available to do something for Bolivian people. So it's, ne it's understandable the necessity of a, a, a new negotiation with respect to, to the gas price. But why to take the shape of expropriation as if we were living in the 50s or in the 60s uh, and when it was possible to imagine a strong national state and support about all the national states across the world with two blocks in the world, <coughs> more two blocks in the world. So the Bolivians have to, uh, not now, but in two, two, three, four, five years, they will depend on decisions by Brazilians because you, uh, we are the, basically, we have the, the, the monopoly of the consumption of Bolivian gas. They have to sell gas to Brazil. They have no, no alternatives. Maybe some to, to Argentina. So they have to take it out at least Brazil and Argentina. And if they are threatening too much and too further, what will happen? The Brazilian oil company will make other decisions. Instead of exploiting gas in Bolivia, we'll try to, to exploit gas in Brazil, because we have, or to import gas from, from Africa. The world is today uh, full of, of, of good uh, transportation system, good communication. So it's not good for Bolivia. This is what was what, what missing in the past, the capacity of our leaders to convince Morales, well, you know, if you go through that road, the, the, the disaster will come. Let's, let's discuss the gas price. But you have to understand that the Bolivians are putting pressure on his, on, on, on his president because they, they, they are in a, in a very bad economic situation and now they have capacity to mobilize, to put pressure. Civil society is, is there and is pressing the president to a, uh, uh, direction, a direction that they believe that is better for, for the country. So I think that uh, it's very important <coughs> In, 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 in our days, for instance, for, 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 as a consequence, you know, that he, uh, to understand uh, that what matters today is not a free will of all, but the participation of all concerned in the deliberation, and if possible, even internationally. Uh, this reality calls for a radical style uh, of political change. Uh, democratic leaders will be those really open to dialogue and prepare to translate what they hear into concrete action. If I learn one lesson in my eight years as president of Brazil, is that in today's world, political leadership is never again once and for all. It must be constantly nurtured and renewed. It is no longer possible to, for the leader to impose without negotiating, to decide without listening, to govern without explaining and persuading. Votes in an election, having those of millions of them, are not enough, as I said. The day after, one has to start almost from scratch. Either the leader inspires and mobilizes around a vision of the future, or loss, or the loss of power is inevitable. 
we must heed the call for truth, respect, and transparency. The responsibility, the responsibility of the democratic leader is to grasp the challenge, break new ground, and show the way forward. In conclusion, let me reaffirm my conviction that democracy is alive in Latin America insofar as it is embedded in vibrant societies and empowered individuals. Deepening democracy in Latin America may well be our best contribution to the goals of promoting substantive democracy at the global level. We are, all of us, confronted with a great intellectual and political challenge, the refraining of a democratic agenda for the 21st century. It was what I'd like to say to you to introduce, to introduce our further debate. Thank you very much. participation of Latin American people. So I am not just referring to NGOs specifically. Civil society is ample than NGOs. See? <coughs> I'm not just speaking about NGOs. I'm speaking all together. If you have the free press, you have the unions, you have lots of our universities, lots of organizations, we, have, we do not belong to the state and are part of the civil society. So is the interaction between all these institutions plus the NGOs, <coughs> and I have no restriction in terms of national or international, but it would, will produce a new uh, atmosphere in <coughs> favor to democracy. But anyhow, it's uh, always the local people. Democracy cannot be imposed. It has to be uh, accepted or inspired, maybe, but have to be uh, you know, rooted in, 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 in domestic uh, society. Otherwise, it's, it's impossible. To, to, to continue to, to work democratically to be for a period of time and it's over. But that, that's not the case. So it's, it's, it's a very delicate plan. Democracy is a very delicate, delicate, delicate plan uh, or delicate animal because it depends on several things. It depends also on culture, <coughs> on civic culture. But it's, I, 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 I will use the same repeat and again and again that we have a tremendous problem in my country. In Brazil, we have, well, let's say, we consolidate democratic institutions in Brazil. The judicial system is independent from, from the executive system. We have elections, we have several parties, we have lots of parties. Uh, we have uh, free press, uh, religions, uh, religious groups are very active in trying to remove parts of Brazilian uh, society. But we don't have yet what is fundamental, is the due respect of legal process, the respect to the law. And without having the, 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 the profound belief that the law counts, it's impossible to have even equality. Because if you, are not, if you don't imagine, if you imagine, it's possible to have some people submit to the law, other law, well, this is unjust, it's impossible. If you don't have at least equality vis-à-vis -vis the legal system, we cannot have equality in general. And in, in unfortunately, even in Brazil, or 
uh, in not just in Lausanne, but in, uh, we have a, a very a small uh, amount of respect to the law, to the enforcement. You know, NGOs are very active. Take one, one, one important issue, environment. <coughs> the Amazon, Amazon forest. Will burn, will disappear, etc. Et it's true. It's possible. Mainly because of, of the, uh, you know, the uh, climate change. This could, could affect dramatically the, the energy situation. But anyhow, uh, when I was in office, we organized a system to monitorize the whole Amazon region by satellites, etc. And run out. So since that period on, uh, the government knows. One uh, in one specific area, there is fire, meaning that some people trying to, to destroy the forest, and then they, they put fire in order to prepare the, the land to, to, to like for cultural purpose. <coughs> but the government has not the instruments to go there to stop the fire, because it has no cap capacity, administrative capacity, people, and, and, and it has not yet the velocity to go there. So. Uh, you have to to enforce decision, to enforce law. This, to me, are the main controversial problems in about democracy in Brazil. How to really to transform or to give more strength in our civic <coughs> culture about the respect of the law and how to enforce decisions, including uh, legal decisions. We have a judicial system. I said to you, is independent from the executive branch. It's true. But it, it takes so long to, 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 to reach a, a decision in our judicial system that pe poor people, say, well, they feel, well, they, what's, well, this is not to me. I, I cannot wait for so long time to have a, a decision. I, I don't have money to pay the lawyer. So these are the, the aspects of democracy, which I see we have to, uh, to debate and to discuss. It's not more the formal architecture of the of democratic system. This is across Latin <coughs> America. Parties, elections, etc. We need much more than that. And certainly, we have to have this kind of interplay between different kinds of NGOs and no NGOs from Brazil, from other parts of the world. I don't, I don't see as a possibility just to close one nation. No more. We have internet. We have, oh, today, the information flow is enormous. And, and this is very good. Hopefully, it's like that. Because this can produce more impulse for more democracy. Thank you. On balance, is uh, globalism contributing to democracy in Latin America or making it more difficult? Well, it depends on uh, <coughs> uh, in different situations. I don't, I don't, I don't like to, to see the globalization as, you know, the devil. It's not that. It's a new form of, to organize the, the economic system. It is true that globalization produced two difficult uh, results. One is fragmentation. And the other one is marginalization. Lots of countries just don't have access to the global market. They cannot compete. They, they, they have not enough, you know, technological strength. They, they, sometimes they don't have leadership. Uh, they cannot compete. And they are submitted to, you know, uh, overimposing uh, uh, rules of the, 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 the global economic uh, system. So they, they, they can be put a little bit aside. On the other hand, uh, globalization produces fragmentation. <coughs> and creates some networks, uh, jumping borderlines. Yesterday I was giving a seminar at uh, Brown University for graduate, uh, undergraduate students. So they asked me something serious <coughs> that. I said, oh, look, Sao Paulo maybe is more uh, close to New York the New Orleans. Uh, uh, Sao Paulo is more like New York. Yeah, but if you go to some parts of Brazil are more close to Africa than to, than to Sao Paulo. Uh, if, you, if you take into account the fact that now we have global cities, I don't know how many, 15, 20 global cities, interconnected by the information of flow, by lifestyle, by the fact that they are permanent Migrating, migration flow, not poor migrants, but uh, executive people, technicians, people from uh, some, some specialization. So these, they are 
forming a kind of hyper-national network. So this produces another consequence in each, in each nation. So I'm not saying that it's good or bad. It's different. And you have, I cannot counsel globalization, because globalization is a consequence of technological transformation, of transformation in the way how the flow of capital works in the, in the world, but produce differences. So in some cases, maybe globalization will produce bad consequences in the world because it could disintegrate the nation, because it could you know, prevent better uh, <coughs> roles for the nation. You have no more alternatives. So this could produce populism. But they, this could, you know, can uh, uh, give in, in incentives to those who blame the foreigners, the global uh, arena. And it's easy for people to understand. I'm, I'm losing space in my country. I'm not more uh, having access to the market, or the working labor market. I have no hopes for the future. So let's try to move everything. We have to understand, this is also a product of globalization. I'm not saying that globalization is bad because of that. I think that we have to take into account that it could produce this kind of, of disintegration effect. All right, let's have one more question because I don't know many people want to get their books signed over here. This okay. question right over here. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. President, for speaking to us. I wanted to know, in your opinion, what psychosociological factors must be in place in order for democracy to uh, develop, mature, and deepen? Thank you. Well, I would say, uh, well, let, let, let's be phrasing it another way. Uh, <coughs> I said that, in, let's make some reflection about my own country. I said it's a big country with some wells, with uh, lots of uh, people uh, all together, and how to link these people, how to give social cohesion. Hmm? Democracy uh, requires a minimum of, of, of cohesion. Have to, people have to agree upon some basic uh, lines. It is still difficult to produce uh, cohesion in, when a society is suffering from what I said, not, not just globalization, but domestic uh, problems. And what are the main institutions in a society uh, capable <coughs> to produce cohesion in, by consequence, later on, democracy. I would say, we have a family. Well, the family is, is, is suffering a, a, prompt, a profound process of transformation nowadays. You know, people marry and then divorce and have another son, the family is, is a confusion. So <coughs> it's difficult to, to lead the family as a, as a basis for the organization of society. And many poor people, when you look at the number, the number of, of, of you know, among the poor of, of, of children without father, is in some countries, Central America, it's more than 50 percent. It's enormous. So how to imagine the family could be the starting point to produce a better society? It's not, it's not easy. It's easy maybe here, but not in these developing <coughs> countries. Then, if, if you look at political parts, I said before, Political parts are going to one direction, so to another one. So it's a kind of distrust vis-à-vis -vis the political, uh, the political uh, life. Uh, well, the family in the past was uh, capable to teach children. Now it's the reverse. Young people are much more alert than, than, than father and mother because they, 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 they know how to use computers, for instance. <laughs> the family doesn't. Then, because of their access to education, in Brazil, 96, 97 percent of children are attending schools. So they have education, fathers and mothers know. If you go to the Maya, Alma Mater, University of Sao Paulo, in the past was top to the elite. Now, if you go to see, the, the number of students whose families, whose parents have never had secondary uh, school is enormous. So how to imagine the the older generation will teach the new generation, impossible. Then I will finish by saying, to my mind, the, the instrument to remote society will be the school, provide you reform the school. <coughs> will be the school, because we don't have uh, any other uh, modern institution capable to produce cohesion. And in the school nowadays, it's not capable either to produce cohesion. Cohesion comes only now 
for the market, for the employment. And this is not good. The market is okay to, to, to produce profits, but not the values for a nation. So I think this is what, what you asked me is the basic question. Mr. President, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much. Thank you.